you got your Bibles, we're going to be in Nehemiah tonight. We're talking to you about the fight of a warrior tonight. What does a warrior look like? How many of you are putting on your warrior gear, armor? So um, we're going to do 13 chapters tonight. God help us. <laughs> There ain't no way to talk about Nehemiah unless you do the whole story. <laughs> so the heart of a warrior, your handout, if you got your handouts, get them out now. And um, if you don't have one, raise your hand and we'll make sure that we get you one. Somebody, there's a few over there on that side. Guys, make sure y'all get a, a handout tonight. You're going to need it. So the heart of a warrior... How many of you know that you got to hear the Word of God, which is God's purpose, God's plan for your life? The Word that you hear from God has got to be an on-time Word. It's got to be a, a, a Word that's for you, and that Word registers in your heart. In other words, when you hear it, it becomes a burden in your life. It becomes some kind of weight. I, I, I remember when, when God started to call me to the ministry and I was working a secular job. It was absolutely killing me to have to go to that job on a daily basis because I had a burden in my heart to preach the gospel. And, and every time I'd go to a secular job and wasn't doing what the word of the Lord was for my life, God's purpose, it was a tremendous burden. This was a job that I absolutely loved when I first started working there. And I couldn't wait to get to work on a daily basis. And then when the call of God came on my life, the word of the Lord, the purpose of God, the will of God for my life, it became a weight. And when I would try to do anything other than what I was called to do, how many of you know I was miserable? Are y'all out there? I was absolutely miserable. And uh, I bored as long as I could. And one day I just came in and told Sister Jeannie. I said, I just resigned today. <laughs> After I picked her up off the floor. <laughs> She said, you did what? <laughs> what are we going to do? I said, I don't know what we're going to do, but we ain't doing that no more because I cannot go back to that job one more day. I got to follow my heart. I got to do what's in me. I can't keep going against what God has placed in my heart. I don't know what we're going to do, but we ain't going to keep doing the same old, same old and get the same results, right? We got to change because God is moving us. God's doing something different in our hearts and in our lives. And I've got to follow the word of the Lord that he's speaking to my heart. So Nehemiah heard the word of God in his heart. Here's what happened. It really overwhelmed him. It overwhelmed him. It caused him to sit down. It caused him to weep. Listen, what makes you weep? What makes you pray? What makes you fast? What makes you moan and groan within you? I, I just thought just for a second about Mary and Martha when they met Jesus and Mary came out and Lazarus is dead and, and Jesus, when he saw Mary weep the worship, he groaned, he moaned within his heart and in his life. A righteous anger rose up in him. Listen, when you got the call of God, when you have the word of God, some kind of purpose God's called you, it causes you to moan. It causes you to groan on the inside of you. Listen, how do I know what I'm called to do? How do I know what God's will is for my life? What keeps you up at night? What makes you pray? What makes you weep? What makes you moan and groan on the inside? That's your call. Yes. Oh, yes. Talk to me. Yes. Hallelujah. And 
And you can't do what you don't have the grace of God to do. If you're not called, listen, if Ricky Sinclair wasn't called here, there's no way I could stand the warfare. So let me tell you something. What you're called to do, God will give you the grace to do it. Somebody better shout in this place. Because when God calls you to do something, He equips you to be able to do it. No matter how crazy it looks to you, what I do, or how crazy it looks for me, for what you do. Look, because God is, God is speaking to every one of our hearts individually. Your call is not my call. Your gift is not my gift. Your talents are not my talents. So what I think you need to be doing, what I might think, oh my God. Shut up. You're not called to do what they're called to do. You live your life and you let them live their life. So the burden that Nehemiah received in his heart and his life, it literally transformed him into a warrior for God's kingdom. So how do I become a warrior? Because it's a burden that's on the inside of me. It's a call. It's a word that God has placed in me for me. And it makes me a warrior. It transforms me into something that I'm not. Into something that God can use for his glory. Somebody better shout in this place. And here's what the scripture says, chapter one in Nehemiah, starting at verse four. And it came to pass when I heard these words, I sat down and I wept and I mourned certain days. He actually mourned and fasted and wept for four months before he approached the king of of Babylon. And he fasted and he prayed before the Lord. And he said, oh, Lord, I beseech you, oh, God of heaven, you're great and you're powerful. You keep covenant and mercy for them that love you and observe your commandments. Let your ear now be attentive and your eyes open to my prayer that you may hear your servant's prayer which I pray before you now, day and night, shall somebody, it was on him. Every day, all day. Every night, all night, it was on him. For the children of Israel, your servants, and I confess their sins, the sins of the children of Israel, which have sinned against you. Both I and my father's house, we have sinned against you and we repent for it. We have dealt very corruptly against you, Lord, and have not kept your commandments, nor your statutes, nor your judgments, which you did command your service through Moses. Remember, I mean, you know, he's praying the word of God back to God. He's reminding God of the covenant that his people have with him. How many of you know that when you hold God to his word, when you remind God of his word, he says, remember, I beseech you, the word that you commanded your servant Moses saying, if you transgress, I will scatter you abroad among the nations. That's why the walls of Jerusalem were burned down. That's why Babylon took Israel captive. And that's why Nehemiah right now is captive. He's been captive for 70-something years now. He's the king's cupbearer. Isn't it good to be in the presence of the king? And now the Lord has placed this word in him. He's heard a report about God's city, Jerusalem, and how it's been burned down and how the people are suffering and, and it, this becomes a burden in his heart. And he, so he starts to pray to God to do something about it. He starts to remind God, you said that you would scatter us if we disobeyed you. We did disobey you and you did scatter us. But then you promised that if we would repent and come back to you and I'm talking to somebody. 
that I would restore you according to the covenant that God has made with his people. Can I just tell you, it doesn't matter how far you've gone away from God, but tonight if you will choose to come back to God, if you'll choose to sell out to God, God will receive you back. The covenant that God has with us is if we repent and ask God to forgive us, the the word of tonight from Ricky Dory was this, that he'll cast your sin as far as the east is to the west and the sea of forgetfulness ever, never ever to remember it ever again. Shout somebody. That's the promise of God. Jesus. <laughs> Nehemiah. I'm talking about warriors tonight. I'm talking about how you, you get the heart. Because you can't be a warrior without the heart. And you can't have the heart without the word of God, his purpose. And this is how you have the heart of God. This is how you do great things for God and his kingdom. His purpose for your life. Come on, shout somebody. But if you turn unto me and keep my commandments and do them, Though there were of you cast out unto the uttermost parts of heaven, yet will I gather them from all over and will bring them unto the place that I have chosen to set my name there, the city of God, Jerusalem. And this is what Nehemiah is praying about. Now these are the servants and your people whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. How many of you know the Lord's got a strong arm? <laughs> oh, Lord, I beseech you, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayers of your servants who desire to fear your name, reverence you, and prosper. Look at your name and say, prosper. I pray thee, thy servant this day, grant him mercy in the sight of this king that I'm about to approach. For I was the king's cup bearer. Can I just tell you number two in your handout? God honored Nehemiah. God honored and answered Nehemiah, his heart, a warrior's heart, and a warrior's prayer. It was the will of God. Nehemiah reminded God of his covenant. He reminded God of his promise. Here's, here's successful prayer. You find God's promise in his word. Then you pray God's word back to him. And when you pray God's word from earth back to him, heaven answers your request because it's God's will and his purpose for your life. And he sends the answer back down and your prayer becomes answered. That's how it works. But it's always about God's will. So the king of Babylon gave Nehemiah, he gave him the right to go. Now he's in captivity. He's the right hand man of the king. How I many you know you don't want to let go of your good help? But God gave Nehemiah favor before the king. How I many you know that when a man pleases the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him? Listen, I'm telling you, favor comes upon God's precious people. I've seen favor over and over and over in, in, in all of our lives. Just things work out right. All glory to God. It's because of the favor of God. And what this meant was, was when, when, when Nehemiah approached the king and he was sad. Listen, let me tell you something. You didn't come in front of the king with a bad attitude. This ain't no democracy. This, this ain't a theocracy either. This is a dictatorship. He's king is the boss. He's total authority. 
He runs everything. And when you're in his kingdom, you don't own yourself. He owns you. He owns all the land. He owns all, owns all the houses. He owns everything. Because he, he, he's the king. It's all his. And you serve at his mercy. Serve at his pleasure. And therefore, if you came before the king and you were sad and you had a bad attitude, you were, yeah, somebody said, chop, chop. I heard you, sister. <laughs> it's very possible that you could have gotten chop, chop. So Nehemiah was fearful. The scripture said that he feared even for his life. Because the first thing the king said is he saw the sadness in Nehemiah and he says, this is not sickness, this is sadness of heart. What's wrong? Nehemiah said, my people are struggling. The graves of our fathers have been overgrown with brush and our walls of our city are burned and what little remnant of our people that's left are in jeopardy because there's no safety. There's no wall of protection. Listen, let me tell you something. They believed in walls for protection here. I'll tell you that right now. America might could learn something from this. Because you didn't have a wall back then. Your wife and your children, everybody was in jeopardy because anybody could come in and take you. What's the difference today? So I didn't even want to get into that. But the thing is, is, is that Nehemiah said that because of my people that are struggling, I'm sad for them. And the Lord touched the king. How many of you know that the king's heart is in the Lord's hand? The Lord is able to speak to a secular person even. The Lord is able to even move a secular person for the will of God. Listen, God is able. And the Lord, and, and Nehemiah said, the reason why I'm sad is because my people are in jeopardy. And the king said, well, what's your request? Shout somebody. Wait, I'm a prisoner. <laughs> I'm in captivity. I'm locked up. What are you requesting? I'm requesting that you let me go. That you give me all the money I need. That you send an army with me to protect me. And let me go and rebuild the walls of Jerusalem and become governor of that region to oversee my people. And the king said, okay, how long will it take you? And so the king wrote him a letter. Come on, shout somebody. I'm talking about the will of God, the purpose of God. I'm talking about a warrior. I'm talking about you've got a word from God in your heart, a word that's burning, a word that's a burden, a word that's causing you to weep, a, a, a word that you can't eat, you can fast, a word that's making you stay up night and day to pray to God that God will cause this great work to come to pass. And now the Lord gives you favor with a secular king. He, he takes you out of captivity, gives you all the money you need and all the protection you need. And then he gives you permission to go into the king's forest and get all the trees you want so you can rebuild the walls and the gates. There's 12 gates too. I'm going to study those gates one day and, and preach them as well. So Nehemiah then gets a vision. He's got permission now and he takes off. Nehemiah told of the work that he needed to, that needed to be done to the, to the elders and to the rulers and to those that were in Jerusalem when he got there. By the way, he went, when he got over there, Sanballat and Tobiah, when they heard that he was coming to rebuild the walls, how many of you know that not everybody's going to celebrate your vision? Not everybody's going to go with you. Not everybody's going to have the joy of the call of God that's on your life. Not everybody's excited you got saved. 
Man, they used to talk to you when you were, talk about you when you were a sinner, and now you done got saved, and they still talk, holy roller. You think you better than us. We've always been this denomination. We were born this. You're a, you're a traitor. I heard all of that stuff while they're drinking and smoking and cussing and fussing, stunting and stumbling. <laughs> <laughs> they were still talking about I said look you didn't like me when I was smuggling and you don't like me when I'm I'm preaching the good news so I'm just going to be what God called me to be whether you like it or not I'm just going to do what God called me to do whether you like it or not because I found out that it don't really matter anyhow you ain't really living for anybody but you anyhow it's all about you So hallelujah. Are y'all alive out there? How about Nehemiah? How about a warrior's heart? Man, I pray the warrior's heart upon every one of you tonight. Every one of you that are watching me tonight, I release the anointing for a, a spirit of boldness. I release the power of God for his will and purpose for your life tonight. I don't know what God's called you to do, but whatever God's called you to do, I pray that that burden comes upon you so you can fulfill God's will and God's purpose for your life. So Nehemiah number three in your handout starts to cast the vision. Nehemiah told of the work that needed to be done in the city of Jerusalem. He he told them about the reproach of God's people that would be taken a uh, that would be taken away for their great work in other words when we finish building these walls and these gates it's going to restore Israel's dignity it's going to restore your self esteem it's going to make you feel like you're a nation again god's going to use this to really raise you up and do something great in their lives. And so he starts to cast that vision. And then Nehemiah recruited all of the people of God that had a mind and had a heart to build God's kingdom. Now, I'm not going to read these scriptures. I've given you all the scripture here, and you guys can go back um, and look at these scriptures. But uh, I, I got a pretty long lesson. I'm going to get through it tonight because I think it's important that you get a hold of all the points that I got in this message. So Nehemiah's got a burden. He's got a word from God. Now he's got a vision. Now he starts to cast that vision. And as he casts that vision, now there's enemies. Every time you have a work of God, every time you're called by God, and you have a vision from God to see it come to fruition in this life, there will always be enemies. Listen, when I first started, I didn't understand that there would be enemies of the vision. I, I was just naive. I, I even thought that all the other churches would be excited that we were building the kingdom of God and never understood territorialism, if that's even a word. <laughs> but I didn't understand. I just thought that, man, we're building the kingdom of God and and everybody's excited about people being transformed and people being saved and receiving eternal life. And man, uh, people are transforming, man. This is the work of God and, and everybody wants to see that. But I didn't understand that there would be enemies. And so immediately... Here comes the enemies of of your faith. The enemy mocked. They laughed. They became angry at the work of God. What? (laughs) You're mad at me for telling people good news so they can have eternal life and live a great life here because when you get saved, you... You get out from under the curse and you get under the blessing and you're mad at me for that. Some kind of way I'm doing something wrong. Critics, so the first enemy was criticism. Critics always think they can do it better than you. 
Critics always think they know more than you know. And you're the one that has the vision. (laughs) My answer is you never let critics control you. And you always outlast the critics that come against you. So probably the first enemy of your vision, of your faith, will be people that will criticize you. You just outlast the critics. That's all you got to do is just outlast them. You just keep doing what you were called to do. And you don't worry about people that are cynical and critical of you. You just keep moving forward in the name of Jesus Christ. Somebody shout, help me out a little bit. Shout a little bit. The next thing was conspiracy. Somebody will always try to conspire against you. It never ceases to amaze me. Who in the world has time to sit on a computer and attack you and write articles about you and and spend their day trying to find something wrong with you? Sitting in your parking lot, spying on the church to see what's wrong with the church so we can get them. (laughs) What? (laughs) Until the attacks, I never knew the effect that we were really having in the kingdom. When the live news truck showed up, I said, oh yeah, we're doing something. (laughs) Hallelujah. Hallelujah. When they came to discredit, because if they can discredit you, they can kill the message that you have by belittling you and attacking you and making you seem like you're not what you say you are. The attacks, conspiracy, conspiring to come against you. Listen. If you told me that I had to go chase you and binocular you and watch you and try to find something wrong with you and then tell the whole world, I would just tell you, who's got time for that? I tell you who's got time for that. A person that has no ambition, a person that has no vision from God, a person that that is possessed. You got to be possessed. Because it ain't natural. Have you thought about going to work and providing for your family? (laughs) You know, the same word that I preach is the one that says that if you don't take care of your family, you've denied the faith. Jesus. Who's got time to conspire against someone else to bring them down? God, I pray for all the enemies. In fact, I pray the same prayer Nehemiah prayed. Lord, behold your servant. Look at the works that we're doing. And all of those that have conspired to come against us, Lord, I pray that you will, the net they set, they themselves will entrap themselves. Lord, I pray you send your angels to oppress them in the name of Jesus. Wear them out. I pray they can't sleep at night. They want to chase somebody good. Give them a little dose. Get them, Lord. Look at my heart, Lord. I pray that you cause them to repent. You put so much on them that they turn to you, God. I pray that in the name of Jesus. Conspiracy. Now, that's where I'm at, right? We've done criticism, so we're on conspiracy. Conspiracy then. Sambadon and Tobiah, they conspired to attack and fight against Jerusalem to hinder the work that God wanted to do. Here's what they did. They sent letters over and over and over. Scary letters. They'd send a letter saying, we want all of Israel to know that Nehemiah is building the wall so that he could be king and take over the kings that are surrounding them. 
And Nehemiah would send back and say that that came out of your own heart. I have no intention to do that. That's a scare tactic. You're trying to to cause some kind of conspiracy thought to be manifested for gossip in some kind of way, cause the kings to come and attack us. In fact, we're here because uh, King Xerxes has given us permission to come here and has actually funded the project. Shout somebody. Thank you, Jesus. So they sent letters. They actually even had some kin folks that they sent. There was um, Judah actually had a son-in-law or a daughter-in-law that some kind of way was kin to Tobiah's son. And they sent the kin folks to try to persuade Nehemiah and them to stop building the wall. How many of you know that they're going to send the letters against you? They're going to send even kin folks against you. And then they sent false prophets that prophesied. Man, I don't... (laughs) Jesus. And number three, complainers. So the enemies of our faith, the first one is criticism. The second one is conspiracy. And the third one is complainers. Now, these others were basically outside. So they were outside enemies. But how many of you know that there could be some inside enemies? Somebody said, well, uh, what do you say? What does your mouth say? Because if your mouth doesn't line up with the vision and the man of God and the heart of God's man, and you're in his house that God has given him a vision for, and you're talking against it, then I'm going to have to tell you you're a defector. You're actually an enemy. On the inside, the worst kind. Oh, somebody got quiet in here. (laughs) It got quiet in here. Judah said that they were tired. See, because each tribe had a gate that they were responsible in a breach of fence they were responsible to build. And Judah had their part. Judah says they wasn't praising, by the way. They started complaining about the work and that it was too hard and that they were tired and that they couldn't go anymore. How many of you know that your tiredness and your weariness can turn into complaining if you're not careful? But how I many you know we're, we're running on the strength of God, man? We're doing the will of God. Our, our faith and our hope and our trust and our strength comes from the Lord. Shout somebody. They said, our adversaries, this is what the gossip is. This is what the word on the street is that we would not know or even see when they attack us. I don't know if we can, I don't think we can sustain an attack from our enemies. I mean, you know, that kind of talk gets going on inside. And then you have a a rebellion that rises up on the inside of the church that actually kills the vision and the the heart of God from manifesting in the house. So you got to be careful that your mouth says the right thing and releases the right spirit. Shout somebody. And this is in your house too because you can kill your spouse. You can smother your spouse. Your control and your manipulation and your domination will kill somebody. It will release the wrong spirit and put people in bondage and kill the flow of God's Holy Spirit that brings liberty and life in your house. It's real quiet now. They said, Judas said, they will come from all around us and there's nothing that we can do about it. They'll take us. Church members must make sure that everyone has something good to say. I'm going to tell you straight up, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear we can't. I don't want to hear it's too big. It's too small. If only we had... 
we need to do it like this. No, you need to get in formation. You need to get your butt in place. You need to be the body of Christ. You need to do what God has called you to do according to your gifts and your talents. We must never complain in this place. We must never speak against the vision of the house of God. Never speak against the man of God that God has given a vision to. You will destroy what God is trying to build. A foolish man tears his own house down with his own hands. Foolish man or woman does that. Foolish. I, I tell you, while I was in the prayer room, I, I hesitated about get your butt in formation. But the Holy Ghost said, no, you tell them straight up, get in your position, boy, and stop back talking. Do what you're called to do. Be who God has called you to be. Do what you're supposed to do. Can I get an amen? Why? Because the man that says it can't be done should never interrupt the man who is doing it. Never. Never get in the way of a doer. The man is doing it, now you're faulting him. Have you lost your mind? When Judah was discouraged and they were releasing the, the discouragement amongst all the tribes, somebody shout. Nehemiah came up with two things that he told them that they must do. He said this, remember the Lord that he is powerful. He is glorious. He's great. And remember the reason why you're doing what you're doing. We must never forget the cause. We must never forget the reason why we do what we do in this place. And he told them the reason why you do what you do, you are a warrior fighting for your brothers. You're a warrior fighting for your wives. You're a warrior fighting for your, your children. You're a warrior fighting for your house. You're a warrior fighting for your city and for your community. You are a warrior. The reason why you're fighting, the reason why you're standing is because you love God with all your heart and you love your family and you're fighting for what is right. That's what he said. Never forget the reason. Your focus is the reason. Your focus is not your enemies. You can't look at your enemies and get anything done for God. You got to look to God and you got to look to your family and you got to fight with all that's within you for the glory of God. You are a fighter. You're a warrior. You got to fight. Y'all going to make me lose my voice tonight. You guys got all the scripture to back up everything that I'm saying. <laughs> so what was the result? The result was this. The Lord fought their battles. When their focus was God and their family, the Lord fought their battles. Why? Because everyone started praying. Everyone came together in unity and in one accord. Listen, let me tell you something. We can't do anything for God unless we're all in this thing together. Listen, this church is going to take all of us coming together. You guys got to get behind me, man. If we're going to take this city, if we're going to take this region, if we're going to take this world... We got to do this thing together. I can't do it by myself. This is the body of Christ. Jesus is the head. Shout somebody. I got a vision from God. We can do it. We are well able. 
Listen, we're doing it for the Lord. And we're doing it for our families. How many of you want to see your kids in heaven? How many men want to take your wife with you to heaven? That's what I told my wife. You're going to heaven with me, girl. Because we're going to serve, as far as me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. I done already done the stupid thing. I got the t-shirt and all that good stuff that comes with it. Is it really good? And I ain't going back. My eyes are focused on the mission of God. And I choose to fight and to die for what I believe. I believe in you, Lord Jesus. I believe in heaven. I believe that this is the will and the purpose of God for all mankind. And I'm going to fight not only for myself, but I'm going to fight for every human being on planet earth. And I'm going to preach the good news with everything that's within me. Everything you created me to be, I'm going to release the anointing of God. I'm going to release the authority of God's kingdom everywhere I go because I believe this with all my heart. I am totally committed and sold out to you, Lord. My focus is you, Lord. And I'm very happy to die for what I believe. I'm very happy to lay my life down for what I believe. Because if you don't have some reason, something to give your life for, what are you doing, man? What are you living for? What... (laughs) You got to have a cause. You got to have a reason. You got to have a purpose. You got to have a God purpose. You got to have God's word. Or life means nothing. Life makes no sense without God, shout somebody. I already did it without God. So what did they do? They fought their battles. They rebuilt the wall of Jerusalem, the city of God. They did it in record time. They did it in 52 days. They rebuilt the whole wall of Jerusalem, and it stayed burnt for over 100 years. In fact, Ezra tried to rebuild it, and Sanballat and um, Ballad and uh, Tobiah attacked him, and, and they quit the work. Because there's always enemies of our faith that come against us. We got to press on. Nehemiah, when those devils came, he withstood them. He refused to submit to their accusations. He refused to submit to their conspiracy, to their criticism. He refused to submit to complaining, people complaining on the inside. He told them the reason why we're doing what we're doing is because God is a great God and we believe in him and his kingdom and we're living for him and we believe in our families. We love our children. We love our wives and we want our families to live a good life. This is the reason why we're doing what we're doing. We believe in what we're doing because this is the reason. It's the reason. There is a cause. David, before he attacked Goliath, he stood up and he says, is there not a cause? All of Israel and Saul, big old looking strong Saul hiding behind a rock with Israel. Little old ruddy David shows up. Here comes Goliath stomping out, uh, criticizing Israel, and telling them how weak they were, and they were scared, and send a man out to fight me. And whoever wins, they will be the Lord over this region, that nation. And David heard it. David said, Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that defileth the armies of the living God? You sissies, what are y'all doing? Is there not a cause? And then he went and got his slingshot. They laughed. Little old guy with a doggone, a little, a little, a little leather and five smooth stones. Somebody said he might have had some brothers. David ran out there in the power of God. 
You know what he said before he hit him between the eyes with a rock? He said, this day, my God will give you, give me your head. David didn't even have a doggone sword to cut it off with. Had to take the enemy's sword and cut his own, his own enemy's head off with the enemy's sword. So you better shout. But he said something. He said, there's a reason, there's a cause. I believe in God. I believe in covenant. I believe in our families. I'm going out. I got God with me. I'm going to do this giant in, man. I don't know who the giants are in your life, but I know one thing. You got to rise up and say, there's a cause. There's a reason why I'm living. I'm going after this giant. I'm going to conquer him. I have a covenant with God. I have the authority. I have power. I refuse to lay down. I refuse to hide. I refuse to sit around while the devil makes fun of me. No uncircumcised Philistine that doesn't have a covenant with God of heaven and earth will ever rule my life. I rule you. I'm in authority here. I have dominion over the earth, not you. And I take my dominion and my authority. So they fought then, E then. They fought to restore Israel's dignity, man. When those fences came back, they became a nation. God started sending Israel back to their homeland again because something was happening. Momentum was taking place. Are y'all out there? I mean, no, you got to get the momentum. You got to get the big mo. Got to get it flowing. You got to get it going, man. So if you feel stuck, if it doesn't feel like anything's moving, man, you got to get it going, man. You got to get momentum going for you. Rolling. Momentum is a power that will cause things to happen for you in your life. Momentum will push you over. Listen, you can't be um, ordinary. You got to be X. You got to put X in front of it. You got to become extraordinary. You do that by putting X in front of it. So they restored their families. They restored the safety of the city. They restored back the worship center. And the will and the purpose of God was done because of the vision and the word of the Lord. Their work had become known as a work of God done in record time, 52 days that what other nations said around them when they saw those walls come back up and and those gates rebuilt and the people coming back in and Nehemiah became the governor over that region. What they said was, was this is a work of God because nobody could have rebuilt this place in 52 days. Only God could do that. And it became a great witness for the glory of God. Can I tell you, when you live for God, when you sell out for God, your life will become a witness for God. People will see you in your action. People will see God in you by the way you carry yourself. And here's the, the leader, the pastor's need for the church. We need strong, loyal gatekeepers. We need people that have the pastor's heart. Because you can't build on a people that does not have your heart. If they don't have your heart, you can't be married to them. If they don't have your heart, you can't be in unity. So you have to look for a people. It's not about the numbers. It's about the heart. Because if we take people's hearts that are one and come together in unity, nothing can stop us. But if we have a whole doggone church that has thousands of people and nobody has my heart, nobody has my vision, nobody's really with me, they're still whispering and backbiting and talking behind my back, then what will happen is is the insider complaints will kill the work that God wants to do because if we release demons in the middle of the work, we'll never be able to get the will of God done for the glory of God. So we got to have each other's hearts. That's why I always say, if you don't fit in this place, please go find where you do fit. We love you, man. We want you. But we only want people that are supposed to be here, man. 
Because I can't build on people that are not like me. I can't build on people that are not with me. That's why the Lord said, don't be unequally yoked in your marriage. Because you can't build a marriage on people that are not connected. You got to be connected to have anything. Can I get an amen? I'm saying something. You guys are... You guys are picking up what I'm laying down. So we need, we need strong people who believe in love. They believe in unity. We, we have each other's back. We're for each other. We need people who are totally sold out to the cause. That give their time, their talent, and their treasure. Because if you believe in what we do, you won't have a problem giving. And we need people who fly in the V formation like geese. I want to close by telling you about the geese. The geese, I don't know if you've ever seen it, but they fly in a V formation. And the reason why they fly in a V formation is they can fly 70% further in that formation. And what happens is, is the lead goose that's in front of that V, he breaks the main turbulence of the wind that's coming into them. And when each goose flaps his wings, it creates an updraft for the goose that's in the V with him. And then when the goose in the lead gets tired because he's been breaking the main turbulence of the wind, geese... Rotate. One goose takes the lead again, and that goose falls back into formation. And that's how they fly all the way across the United States. Another thing geese do is when one goose is sick and he goes down into a pond or some kind of water stream, another goose will stay with that goose until he either dies gets well and recovers and can fly again. He will never let that goose go by himself. We need people in this church that fly in a V formation. Who will fly in a V formation? Who won't fly in the V formation? I just want to mark you. Yeah. <laughs> Come on, stand up. Let me pray for you. I mean, you know, you got a warrior's heart tonight. You got a warrior's heart. Your warriors. We fight because we know the reason why we fight. And amazingly, Nehemiah, when Judah were complaining, when they said they couldn't go no more, he said, Don't you ever forget why you're doing what you're doing. Because the reason will give you the strength that you need to keep pushing through for the glory of God. You got to fight for what you believe. You got to go for what you believe. You must never quit. You must never give up. You must never stand down. You must fight with everything that is within you because we have a cause. We have a reason for what we do. So, Father, I pray that you will burn in our hearts tonight the reason why we do what we do in this church, God. Lord, that you will put it in our heart, Lord, that it's about you, your kingdom, and bringing you glory and seeing people saved and seeing people healed, seeing people delivered, God. It's about seeing families, Lord, strong and healthy, Father. Lord, that you'll put this in our hearts. It's about eternity, Lord, seeing people become born again, their desires changing by the desire of the Holy Ghost that's in them, Lord, being born again. So now, Lord, we really do believe. We believe in your kingdom. We believe in you. And we believe in our households, our families. And Lord, we want you, your word, your will, 
your anointing, your presence, your power. We want you in our lives. So now, Lord, as we get ready to go home tonight, I pray that your presence, your great love and your strength, your power, I pray that you will bless every house that's represented in this place, every marriage, God, every child. Lord, I ask you to supernaturally move in all of our hearts and all of our lives. Lord, tonight we decree and declare that Jesus Christ is Lord. Help us, Lord, that everywhere we go, we release you, Lord. God, everywhere we go, we take dominion, God. Lord, every region, every city, Lord, every grocery store, every filling station, Lord, everywhere we go, Lord, we release you, Lord. God, help us to manifest you, Lord. God, let your miracle work and power be manifested in our lives so that people see you in us, Lord. And we become a witness to the nations, a witness to our communities. Now, Lord, bless your people tonight in the name of Jesus. Say with me tonight before we go. Say, Lord, I really do believe in you and your work. I believe Jesus Christ died on the cross, paid my sin debt. I choose by my free will to make Jesus Christ Lord and Savior of my life. Jesus, you are Lord. Hey, if you believe that, God's doing something great in your life. Come on, give the Lord a great big shout. Hey, have a great, great, great night tonight. We love you. We bless you in the mighty name of Jesus.